Hello guys. In this video we are going to learn about the basics of the ECG. As with all investigations, the most important things are your findings on history, examination and basic observations. Having a good system will avoid making errors. To start with, we will cover the basics of the ECG, how it is recorded and the basic physiology. The 12 lead ECG misleadingly only has 10 electrodes, sometimes also called leads, but to avoid confusion, we will refer to them as electrodes. The leads can be thought of as taking a picture of the heart's electrical activity from 12 different positions using information picked up by the 10 electrodes. These comprise 4 limb electrodes and 6 chest electrodes. When electrical activity or depolarization travels towards a lead, the deflection is net positive. When the activity travels away from the lead, the deflection is net negative. If it is at 90 degrees, then the complex is isoelectric. In other words, the R and S wave are the same size. This can often be seen in V4. On the ECG, V1 and 2 represent right ventricle, V3 and 4 septum, V5, V6 and lead 1 left side of the heart, lead 2, lead 3 and AVL inferior territory, AVL again left side of the heart and AVR right side of the heart. The ECG can be broken down into individual components. For the purpose of this, we will look at lead 2. All boxes are based on the assumption that the paper speed is running at 25 mm per second. Therefore, one large square is equivalent to 0.2 seconds and a small square to 0.04 seconds. Now we will see what the segments of the ECG represent. P wave represents atrial contraction. PR interval represents the time taken for excitation to spread from the sinoatrial node across the atrium and down to the ventricular muscle via the bundle of his. QRS represents ventricular contraction. ST segment represent ventricular relaxation and T wave represent ventricular repolarization. These are the normal duration of ECG segments. Now we will go into the important topic, how to read an ECG. There are many different systems to interpret the ECG. This system ensures we will never miss anything. Step by step, we are going to see patient details, situation details, measuring the rate on an ECG, assessing the rhythm on an ECG, assessing the axis on an ECG, P wave and PR interval, assessing the Q wave and QRX complex, ST segment, QT interval, and T wave. Patient's name, date of birth, hospital number, and location are very important. These become important as in the emergency department or acute medical setting, doctors are often shown multiple ECGs. You need to know where your patient is in order to ensure that they can be moved to a higher dependency area if appropriate. We need to know when was the ECG done, the time, the number of ECG if it is one of a series. If you are concerned that there are dynamic changes in an ECG, it is helpful to ask for serial ECGs. Usually three ECGs recorded 10 minutes apart, so they can be compared. These should be always labeled 1, 2 and 3. Also, you need to know whether the patient had chest pain at the time or other relevant clinical details. For example, if you ordered an ECG to look for changes of hyperkalemia, note the patient's potassium level on the ECG.
rate can be calculated in a number of ways. You can count the number of two RS complexes in one line of the ECG that is 10 seconds of usually lead to the rhythm strip. You can also count the number of large squares between two R waves and divide 300 by this number. If the patient is in atrial fibrillation, it is more accurate to report a rate range rather than a single value. When we assess the rhythm, we have to look whether it is regular or irregular. If it is irregular, is it regularly or irregularly irregular? Rhythm can be difficult to assess, especially in bradycardia or tachycardia. Axis is the sum of all electrical activity in the heart. The contraction travels from the atria to the right and left ventricles. As the left ventricle is larger and more muscular, normal axis lies to the left at minus 30 degrees to 90 degrees. As a general rule, if the net deflections in lead 1 and AVF are positive, then the axis is normal. If lead 1 has net negative deflection, whilst AVF is positive, then there is right axis deviation. If lead 1 has positive deflection and AVF has negative deflection, then there is left axis deviation. And these are the causes of the right axis deviation. These are the causes of left axis deviation. Can you see a P wave? If the rhythm is atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter or a junctional tachycardia, you may not be able to see a P wave. At this point, you can also assess whether each P wave is associated with a QRS complex. P waves not in association with QRS complexes indicate complete heart block. Also, we need to assess the P wave morphology. In some cases, there can be notched or bipid P wave known as P mitrale, indicative of left atrial hypertrophy, which may be caused by mitral stenosis. There may be tall P P waves. This is called P pulmonale and is indicative of right atrial hypertrophy, often secondary to tricuspid stenosis or pulmonary hypertension. A similar picture can be seen in hypokalemia, known as pseudo P pulmonale. The PR interval may be prolonged in first degree heart block. The PR interval may be shortened when there is rapid conduction via an accessory pathway, for example in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. PR depression may be seen in pericarditis. A Q wave is an initial downward deflection in the QRS complex. These are normal in left-sided chest leads as they represent septal depolarization from left to right. This is as long as they are less than 0.04 seconds long which is one small square and less than 2 mm deep. If Q waves are larger than these or present in other leads, they are pathological. When we see about the QRS complex, we have to look into the width. The QRS complex normally lasts for less than 0.12 seconds, that is 3 small squares. These are the causes of wide QRS complexes. We need to look at the shape and the height also. The QRS complex may be small in pericardial effusion, high BMI, emphysema, cardiomyopathy and cardiac amyloid. The QRS complex is tall in left ventricular hypertrophy. If the height of the R wave in V6 plus the depth of the S wave in V1 is more than 35 mm, this is suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. The QRS complex can also be tall in young and fit people.
the ST segment can be normal, elevated or depressed. To be significant, the ST segment must be depressed or elevated by one or more millimeters in two consecutive limb leads or two or more millimeters in two consecutive chest leads. You have to look out for reciprocal changes also. ST elevation indicates infarction and ST depression is normally due to ischemia. ST segment depression may also be seen in digoxin toxicity. Here, the ST depression will be downsloping, sometimes known as the reverse tick sign. A mimic of ST elevation is high takeoff. High takeoff is also known as benign early repolarization. High takeoff is where there is widespread concave ST elevation, often with a slurring of the J point. J point is the start of the ST segment. It is most prominent in leads V2 to V5, is usually in young healthy people and is benign. The best ways to differentiate it from myocardial infarction are the ST segments are concave, they are most prominent in V2 to V5, they have a slurred start, the ST elevation is usually minimal compared to the amplitude of the T wave, there are no reciprocal changes, the ST segments do not change over the time. The QT interval is the time between the start of the Q wave and the end of the T wave. The QT interval is corrected for the heart rate giving the QTC. As a quick check, if the T waves occur over the halfway between the QRS complexes, the QTC may be lengthened. A long QTC interval, known as long QT, is especially important to identify in patients with a history of collapse or transient loss of consciousness. These are the causes of long QT. The T wave can be flattened or inverted for a number of reasons. There is normal variant of T inversion, commonly inverted in AVR and V1 and often in V2 and V3 in people of Afro-Caribbean descent. Other reasons are ischemia, ventricular hypertrophy, strain pattern which is usually seen in lateral leads, left bundle branch block in which there is T wave inversion in the anterior lateral leads, digoxin and hypokalemia can cause flattened T waves. Hyperkalemia causes peak T waves. The classic changes in hyperkalemia are small P wave, Halt into T waves, white QRS complexes. Widening of the QRS indicates severe cardiac toxicity. Thank you for joining us. In the next video, we will cover up some OSCEs. Subscribe LabG and connect with us. Thank you very much.